I um, just want to say I really appreciate that we're um, doing this together. It just like that, just that basic um, getting to see you all like right now. I'm, I'd like just to ask you all to make sure that you receive the goodness of us all practicing together. And um, I'm amazed at the technology that we can do it, that we can actually do this in the midst of um, the lockdown. So um, I want to thank Jesse for making this possible in terms of actually making it set up and uh, really just getting right now to just go through and, and, and see you all. Just make, just make sure you do that because it's so powerful to get to see everybody. Yesterday, I um, mentioned the phrase, may we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. And uh, something that I think is very important to remember is that as, as we're born into this world, this world of this vast range of pleasure, pain, joy, and sorrow, uh, sometimes we hear the emphasis on the the mind or the heart opening, the body opening, the heart opening, the mind opening. But we really also have to remember that that opening to this you know, kind of staggering really range of, of joy and sorrow requires that also well, we get strengthened, we get strong to be able to be with it. And I feel that in the last few months, I can't tell you how many people have thanked us for um, their practice. Just, just how um, unimaginable it would be to not have it. The strength. So rather than having to shut down <laughs> on, in the last few months or lock down uh, inwardly, I think a lot of us have actually um, amped up, amped up the, uh, our spiritual practice so that we can be with how things are. So that, in other words, the, the spiritual journey is about opening and strengthening, open, opening and strengthening. Michelle, would you just turn your microphone towards your mouth uh, a little bit more? Yeah, this is a new Headset, by the way, everybody. So can you hear me now? Better? A little, just a little. Yeah, let's try that. So maybe you can bend it towards you a little. Just want to make sure folks can hear. Okay. Thank can you, you hear me better now? Yeah? <laughs> Is that better? Okay. There's a um, shrub in Hawaii called crown flower and it has beautiful uh, light green leaves and the beautiful purple flower that um, that often people make beautiful ways with and I've always wanted to grow one and in my time here I've planted a few but um, it's a favorite plant of the monarch butterfly so the monarch butterfly caterpillars eat the leaves. And I've never been able to plant one without a monarch butterfly <laughs> a caterpillar starting to eat the leaves. And um, so it will eat all the leaves and it, it will die because it doesn't even have enough leaves uh, to eat. And then the plant dies. And um, because of the pandemic, <laughs> I've gotten the opportunity to actually not be traveling and to actually kind of monitor um, my new crown flower plant. So actually, um, there are some crown flower plants down the road that I can bring the baby caterpillars to if there's not enough leaves, which um, has happened. And now there is a amazing thing I've never seen before. So this caterpillar, I've been watching the last I don't know exactly how long now, a few weeks, 
uh, in 24 hours, it made a cocoon, like a perfect cocoon. I don't know how many of you know that, but it's not like they make a cocoon over like a week. They like suddenly this caterpillar hung upside, upside down um, one night and then the next morning there was the most beautiful cocoon. And it already had the gold beads on it. It's not turquoise, it's, it's green. Not the, there's not the blue in it yet. Uh, but I felt like it was such an incredible thing for us all to um, understand as a metaphor that, wow, look what happened. We all just went on retreat. We all just went into the cocoon for 20, you know, within a very short period of time. And I'm going to use the example of um, the metamorphosis of uh, the caterpillar to cocoon to butterfly in a few different ways. I think that, um, but the most important thing, beginning, beginning the talk is just to remind us all that um, a cocoon isn't a waste of time. And it's, it's not like uh, there's nothing happening inside it. Just because we can't see what's happening inside that cocoon, what is happening is the most important part of the transformation in that there's this deep rest needed. So there's this caterpillar, right? It's born and it eats and it eats and it eats and it eats. It never stopped eating. And that's kind of the effort that we put into our practice, right? But if you remember your first retreat, it was all about the caterpillar. Who knows if the cocoon ever even happened, but it's like this kind of effort it takes to get going. And then the rest, this magnificent rest. But why? Why do we need this rest and time is not doing? Well, it's like what's actually happening in the cocoon is that the wings are developing and they have to develop to the point where they're strong enough to fly. And we often want to open up the cocoon and get going fine before the wings are strong enough. And so I, I know I can sometimes mix metaphors, but, so, but this is very important, this like opening and strengthening the wing strong enough to take flight um, can be a whole country changing or a whole world changing or an individual changing. It's, it's this, it, um, it takes this enormous timing and the conditions right. Like today, the winds are so strong. The trade winds are so strong. And I went out to check the and it's just blowing around, but it's staying there. It's amazing, you know, just amazing. And I think sometimes the second, third day of a retreat, we can feel like sometimes we're getting blown around. Maybe that hasn't happened. But to trust that um, wherever we are, you know, that often the hindrances start to come up the first few days of retreat. And sometimes when we're at home, we don't even really not recognize them. And to remember that in Vipassana practice, we're actually meant to connect our attention with whatever's appearing, but also to see that when we actually connect, we tend to want to control. And that we're meant to see that rather than thinking, okay, sleepiness happened again, and we think something's wrong, or that uh, it shouldn't be there, and there's that resistance. Um, we might not remember, oh yeah, this is just like, it's not the experience that's happening that matters in this practice. It's how we're relating to it. So when the practice is effortless, when it's like we, we feel like the butterfly, and we just say, oh, I'm sleeping here, and we totally accept it, that's great. But it could be three hours later, we're back to the caterpillar, you know, and we might be just like really struggling along, just eating, 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 and we forget, oh, that it's okay. Uh, 
Oh, great teacher, Srinivas Zargadatta said that we make effort until effortlessness asserts itself. And I, I love that because it, it has a very different kind of languaging than we're used to. It's like that, that effortlessness asserts itself, meaning that um, it just, there's a kind of grace to it. It just comes in, but it just doesn't come in, really. I mean, it, it might be that after 30 years of practice, it comes in. Or maybe it comes in after five days of feeling like, we're in the cocoon and nothing's happening. So when we, when we think nothing's happening, try to remember that something's happening. And often it's just that this, this kind of deep um, inner rest is required to have enough energy for the effortlessness to assert itself. And we often, I find on self-retreat, I often don't realize that I'm getting quiet because there's no feedback system of, about it really, um, other than my own reactivity <laughs> to something. You know, like my neighbor, um, he likes to do weed whacking. It seems like it's, it's on my schedule of sitting rather than any kind of like, understanding what my needs are you know and it just it's like i've even in the years of being where i live i'll try to do my sitting schedule so that it's not when he's weed whacking but he he just seems to tune into when i'm sitting and weed whack and it you know in hawaii the windows are open and you hear this and it's really funny it's almost like every time i go on retreat i'm like okay let's get ready for um, the weed whacker happening at these different times than he usually does it. Um, it's, now that, this might not be that great an example for wherever you are, but it can be internal. It can be restlessness. It can be um, a feeling that the, the energy falls and it's like tempting to even clean the house. It's like, when you're on self-retreat again, I, I find that I know there's so many things about inside my house and around my house that need fixing or, you know, doing something with. And when I'm tired or things aren't going right, there's that added temptation that we don't necessarily have at a retreat center um, to fix it or to clean it. Um, maybe your environment is perfect inside <laughs> and outside and you won't have that temptation, but maybe you'll want to um, put the dishes away in the cupboards like at a at a time that you need to be walking right like it's just there'll be these pulls at home that can be different um, and just to sometimes it's important to keep to a schedule and other times i would say i give myself a little slack when i'm on self-retreat and i can um, I might do a little weeding, uh, not on schedule, but it feels like it's, it's something that will balance me. Um, so I'm using the butterfly as an example of six sense door moment-to-moment -moment meditation practice. It, it's not a perfect metaphor, uh, but sometimes um, it'll feel like the caterpillar will be kind of like that effort to kind of come back and be more anchored with one object. And the opposite of that will be like let, totally letting go of anchoring and just letting the attention um, it's like we, the attention follows the, the moment to moment um, change. Uh, and there's a wide range of people at this retreat and experience, uh, but just um, for now, I think there can tend to be a way in, in kind of recent history and Western meditation practice to value 
um, like a kind of effortless sixth sense to awareness practice and, and think of anchoring as kind of like lesser or baby steps, but, you know, something you graduate from rather than skillful means. Uh, and I, uh, again, on, on, when I've done self-retreats, I find that um, there are times when it's often when I'm in the hallway and doing walking, but I'll really pull, I'll feel very pulled into a very um, quiet, microscopic attention with the walking. And it's really helpful and useful. Or like when I'm sitting and I'll just be with the breath for a while. Uh, maybe more than I, I have been on retreats. But then other times, um, I'll, I'll need to be outside walking, maybe in my driveway or on, in the yard. And I won't be able to do anything but just knowing I'm walking. Like a complete change to just going back and forth knowing I'm walking. Or um, some of you know the Tanku style of walking where I just will walk one pace back and forth and just be aware of seeing. And then one pace back and forth and be aware of hearing. One pace back and forth and be aware of. Um, the physical sensations within the legs moving, and then one pace back and forth of uh, the bottom of the feet touching the earth. And then I've added, that's the Tanku method, but I've added knowing walking as a fifth one, so I usually do five. And if I'm um, needing to switch it, I might switch it just in one pace. As I get quieter, I might do four paces here in the four paces, legs moving. Um, and I find that that really helps. There might be times when I really just need to go for a walk, for example. And um, can you hear okay? I, I, I won't interrupt. I'm not going to No, it's again, okay. But I do want to try it. Can you, it looks like the microphone is pointing towards away from you. And can you just hmm. try to point it toward your mouth a little? I'm just concerned people aren't quite getting. Okay, is that better? Maybe. Better? Worse? I think it's just, it's picking up a lot of background noise. That's okay. I think we'll, yeah. Sorry. I could switch to the other uh, headset. I think it was worse. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm out in my neighborhood and I've really got my neighbors trained to, um, some, of my, some of my neighbors actually look at me and they, they actually go like this and they say, are you in silence? You know, they're, they're really um, shifted from me being a very eccentric neighbor. So especially in the pandemic, uh, they're kind of, um, some of them are copying me and they use some of the places I walk and, it, and then some of them are silent. And it's been very wonderful to see the shift in my neighbors. So there's one spot I walk, which I don't do slow walking, but I go up and down this little hill. It's, it's not super steep, but it's got an angle to it. So I'm figuring I'm getting a little exercise. Not really compared to like what most people probably do, but I go up and down this kind of um, little bit of a hill. And I just go back and forth, like it's a walking practice, but um, it's longer. And I, and it's, um, if you're feeling restless or like you need to kind of get out, if you have a place anywhere near where you live that you can do that and people won't think you're too weird, uh, it's great. And actually what's so interesting is a lot of my neighbors do it. They might not be doing what I'm doing, but they go up and down that hill now. And it's really uh, fun to see the shift again in um, people enjoying that little spot. It's like uh, it, everywhere is a sacred space. And when we're sitting at home, there are many places that um, we start to see, even if, um, if you do a long self-retreat, you would eventually go outside to do shopping for food, for example, and the grocery store becomes a sacred space. Or if you have to drive to the grocery store, you know, the gas station becomes a sacred place. And so we don't have to start having this division between 
um, on retreat and off retreat so distinctly that we do if we haven't done self retreats at home. And, and I want to go into that a little bit more because of the last self retreat I just did, that some of you have heard already in another um, session, that there were so many interruptions of my self retreat that I started suffering around it. Um, but I want to be on this retreat silently. And there kept being interruptions to the point where I was like on retreat, off retreat, on retreat, off retreat, until finally I just had to let it go. And so if you have a situation at home where you can't protect it as well, um, like yesterday, you know, remember how the car drove up when I was speaking? It was the census. They were, it was the census people. You know, and you know who who knows if somebody's going to come and knock on your door or come through. But it's it's just again to know that you do the best you can in whatever circumstance you're in, and then to um, to realize that there'll be times where you'll have that feeling. Oh, I wish I had more protection. I wish I wish somebody was cooking for me on my retreat. You know, for example, it could be anything. But that sense of um, coming back to not making that distinction. It's just life revealing itself moment by moment. Mostly at the beginning of a retreat, of course, we're not, the, um, we're not so much always anchoring, we're not so much going with the sixth sense or awareness, but we're kind of coming back and doing a little anchoring, letting go, doing a little anchoring, letting go. And I have to say that most, mostly um, trust, try to trust how your practice is going with that. In the next few days, um, if you're struggling with what to do, uh, go, go right for now where it's a little easier for you. So if, you, if anchoring is easier for you, anchor. And if just letting the anchor go is easier for you, let it go if, you, if you're confused or struggling. Try not to make a big um, struggle with it. Um, there'll be an emphasis for uh, the attention shifting more to non-conceptual and concurrent. Are you hearing okay? Hmm. Pardon? Okay. Michelle, just when you, can you try to really just bend the microphone so it's pointing toward your face? I, it looks like it's at my face. No, the tip of the microphone pointing toward you. So turn it just a harder, there you go. Yeah, talking, there, bite it, there you go. <laughs> and just think hard. <laughs> Try that, exactly like that, we'll see. No, it's touching, it's hey, touching, hey, hey, hey. it's touching my lip. It doesn't have to touch, but it needs to be pointed at your, there you go, you're good. Okay. <laughs> I eat my microphone. <laughs> okay, is that good? Okay, okay, whoa. It's very close. Okay. Intimacy with the microphone. So in terms of conceptual, non-conceptual attention, uh, there's a um, very short sentence that a great poet, W.S. Merwin, uh, said. Having learned its name, I look at the flower again. So this is a developmental stage for human beings. When we're a baby, we don't know, we don't know the name of the flower. We don't know the name of a chair. We don't know the name of the tree, right? It's like, and we, then we shift to learning the concepts. We learn the names. But in meditation practice, we're shifting to knowing it's a flower, but then 
looking at it again without the name, right? And so that, that um, if you're forgetting this piece where when we're bringing our attention to something, anything, whether it's aversion or the breath or a sound or boredom, whatever it is we're bringing, connecting the attention, recognizing what's happening, the idea is that you connect and try to sustain the attention non-conceptually with the experience. So whether it's lifting your leg or touching the ground or touching your fork or chopstick, anything, anything that you connect the attention with and then sustain the attention through it, of course the concept will come, right? Of course the word foot or the word tree or the word wind will come. Um, but it's like then you bring the attention back to the concurrent non-conceptual movement of whatever's happening. And I would say in these next few days to try to have some patience with this process because if you've been busy um, and not so protected, that shift can be hard. And it takes patience to just um, do the best we can and start again and do the best we can and start again and do the best we can and start again. And to definitely go where it's easier and that's the idea of an anchor. It's like for me, sound was always my first um, place that I would practice non-conceptual concurrent awareness because it was easy. And then I could shift to the breath or I could shift to walking or I could shift to, you know how hard it is to do non-conceptual concurrent awareness with aversion, right? All the like the blaming and the being right comes in, all the concept comes in. But to be able to go, oh, 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 anger, and come back to the physical sensations that are happening in our body, to have space with the thoughts that are coming and going, and to see it more like a, to relate to the experience of aversion, more like a weather front coming and going. Now, we can sustain that with much more interest and energy if we've been practicing that with our legs moving or the, the sound of the, the wind or the breath. It's like we, we learn to practice non-conceptual concurrent awareness with the easier things like body sensations and um, sound. And to remember, it's much harder to do that with loneliness or attachment or rage or sadness or whatever, what all the emotional or, or boredom to have that kind of interest in the non-conceptual um, concurrent experience. And, and of course, this is also why we anchor. It's why we, um, no matter what happens, those, those winds that are buffeting, that cocoon is connected to something that is stationary. It is, the anchor is meant to be something we can come back to uh, that is more neutral to, to calm the attention and to get strong enough again to shift to moment to moment um, awareness when we can, or from something painful like a physical sensation or an emotional or mental pattern. It's like, remember that anchoring is good. It's strengthening. It's not like some far off baby step that uh, you're not supposed to need. Uh, this morning, I was um, wanting to just remind us all that when we, we start a sitting or a walking, if it is hard to be connected with what is, you know, that bare attention, that sometimes starting with a Brahma Vihara that is the easiest for us is really helpful because it helps us connect and um, sometimes we'll forget 
to bring in that tool. So for example, for me this morning, um, I felt not quite focused and not quite able to be there with the hearing scene and um, I just shifted to compassion. And for half the walk, I was doing compassion practice. And that is one of the easiest, it, it is the easiest Brahma Vihara for me to do. But after like 10 or 15 minutes of practicing compassion, um, I felt really this deep contentment connected. It's just, uh, it's my Brahma Vihara of truth. So I just want to say that for some people that might be mudita, not karuna, compassion, but mudita, empathetic joy. It could be that uh, connecting with pleasure and beauty and appreciation of the beauty, with gratitude, or for blessings, you know, appreciating any blessings we have, just to be able to do this retreat is such a, a blessing. And just it can be, you know, I appreciate the joy in my life not caring about pain, you know, and it it's, um, could be that we just, as Steve says, you call in the metta and call in kindness. And it, it doesn't mean that we have to repeat a lot of phrases. It can be just we abide in kindness as we're walking, abide in karuna, compassion, or abide in mudita, appreciation. And for some people, of course, the last one, upeka, equanimity, is the easiest. So if it's the easiest for you, just remember in the course of a day, sitting and walking, that bringing it in for 10 or 15 minutes or a whole session, just finding that deep place of unconditional acceptance without condition. I often just make a soft mental note once in a while, without condition, without condition, without condition. And of course, with everything I've been saying, the idea is that we receive without conditions, or we receive the kindness before we try to shift to abiding. Or we just see the textures and vibrations of sound. We receive the textures and vibrations of the movement of the breath. We receive the textures and vibrations of loneliness. Uh, we're, we're shifting into that deeper uh, receptive awareness that can then shift into the abiding awareness. And if there are times when that effortlessness asserts itself and, and you really are out of the, the cocoon into the butterfly, we really see so deeply the fleetingness of, of existence, the fleetingness of life at moment to moment, uh, change the impermanence. We, we might shift into that deeper understanding of the unreliability of experience and the uncontrollability, the anatta of experience. And, and we can shift to that wordless immersion, just in, in, it's like a serene immersion in fleetingness or uncontrollability. And often uh, we appreciate the Buddha's teaching at, at these times of apamata, apamata, the carefulness we bring to each moment rather than heedlessness, the carefulness we might bring to eating one bite of food or the carefulness we might bring to hearing one sound or just the extraordinary uh, moments when we can really receive a breath, like feel that gratitude for a breath. Anybody that has had 
any closeness to somebody with COVID-19 when they can't breathe. It's, there's nothing like having a, a breath that you can take without that much fear. You know, we take so much for granted and, and having the space to slow down and go through all the difficulty to, to shift into this really deep insight into how things are. Last year before um, we all headed to Burma to teach a retreat there, we went out to teach a Sunday sitting on the land in the north of the Big Island. And it was so windy that um, I had to keep weighing down my papers with a, a, a big stone while I was giving the talk. And then at the end of the talk, I, I have a little basket that I put my papers in. Um, <laughs> and so I put the, the papers in, it's kind of a big basket. I put the papers in and then I took my glasses off, my new glasses that I got, um, my new expensive glasses that I got uh, and put them on top of my papers and the rock was there and all was good. And then it ended, so, you know, the silence ended and some yogi um, brought this big bunch of avocados, not ripe avocados, very hard. Uh, avocados and they dumped them in the basket and uh, broke my glasses, my new expensive glasses. And then um, I went home and I had no other glasses so, and I had an appointment at the doctor the, uh, the next day and I couldn't see what time my appointment was and I didn't go to the appointment on time and it was just a, like a really great um, it's like an example of like how out of control life can seem like it was just this one little thing you know it was like windy and then it was another thing it's like i don't usually put my glasses there and it, some of it i think is just an example of how hard it is to get old in and of itself you know that um it's just harder to keep it all together uh, but it's it's just the, all through that series, I could either have gotten really upset at myself or the weather or, or the person or um, whatever, but it was funny. It was actually funny. I mean, when they dropped all those avocados on my glasses, it was like, wow, that's like really, you know, when it's so bad, it's funny. It's just like, wow. And then when I got to my doctor appointment at the wrong time, it's just like, wow, I'm really sorry. But, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? But it's just to remember that when you're on self-retreat. Because sometimes I find I might do things that I wouldn't normally do. Like I might burn something I'm cooking that just that when you're a yogi, you might just not be moving in the same speed or like do something. Um, try to have that. Um, it's like an apamata, a carefulness with humor. Carefulness with humor. Carefulness with humor. This is, I really, I find that uh, great saying that Wavy Gravy said that, you know, when um, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you, it's not funny anymore, right? You lose your sense of humor when it's not funny anymore. <laughs> it's like, um, I know when I don't have a sense of humor, it's better to go into the cocoon or to take a big walk or, you know, just change the channel. That's what I'm saying, you know, and, and that, that if you um, are trying this real sweet, slow, careful way of practicing and things are not going your way, take a break. Sometimes I do something, I call it useless gazing. Useless gazing is when it's time for a break, but you don't want to go far away. You want to stay at home. And I make a cup of tea because I like tea. Now, it could be that you may um, have some juice or some water. 
about whatever it is, I take my little cup of tea. And if it's nice out, even if it's dark, I might go out and look at the stars and just drink my tea slowly. And I don't try to pay attention to anything at all specifically. Just open up the awareness and, and just sit there. I could sit. This less gazing can happen for an hour. And remember, that's like going in the cocoon where we have this whole ethic that if it doesn't look a certain way, you're, you're not practicing or wasting your time. But on self-retreat, you need to bring these things in, um, I assure you, uh, as a way to balance. And, and you are doing something, even when you're not doing something. <laughs> When we really understand the fleetingness of our moment to moment experience and we see that there's nothing to hold on to, it's going that fast, that there's often like this deep surrender. Oh. There's often this deep surrender and a shift to this um, understanding of contentment and serenity. It's like this unconditional acceptance of, that there is nothing to hold on to. I like to, uh, I say to myself often, all is not, um, but there's such a, a sweet sense that everything is okay the way it is, that deep unconditional acceptance. And you don't have to wait like five days for that or you know, nine days for that. It's just the conditions will come together as where it could be you're eating, it could be you're about to go to sleep, you're walking. Um, but to remember that that's possible, that that very um, deep sense of well-being is possible for all of us and, and that that ultimately is worth some strength. So do you have any questions? Is that Kay? Hi. Can you hear me? There you are. Okay. Thank you. Um, I am um, not struggling, but I being feeling a lot of pain and also just uncontrollability of things. And um, I'm, I guess I'm still trying to intellectually understand how uncontrollably it is, but when it's internal harm, I can wish myself safety and protection. Um, even with external harm from greed and hatred and delusion, to some extent, I can wish there's like safe and safety and protection time to time. Um, and it just, when it's so, and also mortality of it, just because of the COVID, I think a lot of that has been in the mind. And you taught before happy side out, like breathing in, everybody I love will die, and breathing out, so will I die. And I've been practicing it a lot, and that is very scary and also helpful. 
And at the same time, when that death comes from external greed, hatred, and delusion, I just don't know how to like hold that. And because of what's going on right now, it just connects so not even deeply it just like connects it latched on so so tightly and and when that happens I can realize the pain of it and I can bring up some compassion towards myself and that goes away and it just it just being like the wave of like this pain and letting go and pain and letting go and when the concentration goes away and when concepts comes up uh, just blaming and just wondering and um yeah that's been a lot of experience I mean not just today's but just for I think almost a month that's being the experience. Um, yeah. Um. So it sounds like sometimes, say the fear, fear comes up, that sometimes you can connect with that, with metta or compassion, or, you know, if you do the practice of I have to say though, there's times when there is a connection and it's okay, but there are other times when it isn't and it feels like um, overwhelming. Is it, is it, am I hearing that right? Yeah. Okay. And then um, it, it, I actually think it's, of course, it's easier when one's protected by the mindfulness or the metta, right? I mean, it's easier. And when we're not, we're kind of, um, we're, it's like we've, we've, we've fallen back into conditioning. That makes sense, right? So say, for me, conditioning, you know, my conditioning is that usually um, I'm to blame. <laughs> I'm to blame for any pain. And it's all my fault. Um, and the, the self-hatred attack can get really intense. Um, that's, that's um, it took me a long time to unravel that, is understanding that that's actually how I try to protect myself. But I, it's so hard to see when I'm doing it, but I've done it so many, many times that when a self-hatred attack starts, I'm usually able to go, uh, uh-oh, at least, you know, there's a stage of like, uh-oh, I'm about to slaughter myself. And then, oh, I do this. You know, really, I just walk myself through it. I do this as a protection, that self-hatred is a protection. And then I ask myself, I really have to say, I've had to practice it. I ask myself like, oh, what is this protection? <laughs> what? How could this possibly be a protection? Right? It makes no sense. And then I... I'm sometimes, not always, able to drop into just this pure vulnerability, you know, that, that you never know what's going to happen. And that that is really dukkha, but it's like how I was raised is that that's our fault. Dukkha is our fault. And the preemptive strike is to just um, assume the worst and that it's all our fault. And that if I hate myself enough, I won't get attacked. I don't, you know, that there might be a little variation on the thing, but ultimately it's like if you hate yourself enough, you're, you're going to prevent an attack of some sort and, um, or something awful happening. Um, unraveling that is my karmic, one of my karmic knots this lifetime. So actually, I'm, I'm actually really good at like talking about it because I've had so much practice with it. And I must say that compared to you know, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I, um, I'm getting better with it. 
because I recognize it as a defense. I recognize it as condition. And I see how much harm I cause myself. And if I can't get out of it and it's going on too long, I try to do things to change the channel. I don't stay in it. And, and this is something that I think we all have to see. Like, it might not be self-hatred. It could be a physical pain, you know, that is just defeating you and wearing you down. It, it's really the aversion to it that wears us down. But what, it could be loneliness. It, it, it's something that's usually very painful. And the defense with it actually hurts more. Um, but but it's, it's starting to get that, like, I learned that. I learned that defense. And if I don't remind myself I learned it, I actually am merciless with it. I'm take no prisoners, merciless, you know, really, really cruel to myself. And uh, it's like I, I walk myself through it. I walk myself through it. I have a little game I play that if I can't do that, I have a game where I call, I call it hiding from the hindrances. And um, hiding from the hindrances means, you know, you, you run for the hills and I jump under the covers in the bed and I have my stuff in my mouth. And it's like we all have a little party. You know, that can work sometimes and it's really fun and it changes the channel, right? Now, if that doesn't work, I might, you know, go for a bike ride or work in the garden. Self retreats harder. I have a whole series of little fairy tales that for me are really helpful. You know, I'm not saying they'll be helpful for everybody. It's like you have to find what snaps you out of it enough to, um, it's not to get rid of it. The intention is not to get rid of it. A karmic knot is something that you learn everything from this lifetime. And you learn actually eventually to be grateful for them. My karmic knot has taught me everything about anatta, liberation. Uh, it's taught me everything about that uh, the little personal me um, needs so much compassion and metta. And, and uh, that the, the wisdom, my little, that little part of me uh, wants to be fully enlightened so much but needs um, a lot of metta in the process and, and a lot of the changing of the channels when I need it. Um, anything you need to do to change the channel at a certain point breaks the pattern as well. So liberation, mindfulness, metta, all the tools we have are good, but also then moving away from it and getting space from it is also why. Everything I know about gentleness has come from this pattern. It's 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 just <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's so hard when um, <laughs> everything yeah everything is hard. It's just so hard when it's racial stuff right now. It's just like everything is reminded me of like a little just walking outside reminds me of how scared I am to be on this land. It reminds me of and little glimpse of news of anything that's just it's so scary that it's just so scary of this 400 years how that domino effect is still going on and that's still falling down um it's all i can say is that i'm so sorry and it's terrifying like i i, I can't even say how i feel about what you're saying it's horrible there's no excuse for it it's horrible it's just makes me want to cry i just feel so bad Yeah, and it, it's like, um, I do have another technique that probably isn't good for everybody here. But, um, there's another side to the terror, which is rage. And, you know, anybody who's been really abused knows those two sides of terror and rage. And my rage side, I just, I just machine gun down everybody in my mind. 
if I'm that mad. You know, like it helps me get out of the terror, which is just <laughs> kill everybody. Now, that might sound extreme if you don't have that kind of um, situation, but you're, you're living with it and it, it can help diffuse it. Whatever, whatever you need to diffuse it, even if it's call somebody, call somebody and say, I am terrified to go outside. And it's legitimate. It's real. And it, I think that when you, whenever we feel the, the disconnect from the experience, we're not protected. And what I'm saying is that any way you can get yourself connected with it, you'll, be, you'll be, feel protected. But if you can't, that's totally okay. And you do whatever you need to do to feel protected while you're disconnected from it. But, you know, push comes to shove, can't do it, call someone. Kindness. And again, I'm so sorry it's this bad. So maybe we just spend the last few minutes doing some loving kindness and passion. As we did yesterday, taking a few breaths, deeper breaths. And perhaps we can tune into all of us being together right now, learning how to feel safe and protected by connecting with whatever's happening, and really calling in that affectionate awareness that brings whatever is happening to focus, if that brings the safety, the kindness, the affection. Maybe let the attention go out to around your body, the space around your body. However it is you can receive kindness, care, tenderness. You can be just touching your heart center, how whatever's there, numbness, boredom, terror, happiness, quiet, just touching it, receiving the touch. Loving, caring about whatever is appearing. It's okay to be terrified. It's okay to be disconnected. It's okay to be calm. Whatever's there. Being able to say to oneself, I care about myself. This is who I am. May I be peaceful with whatever is happening.
I'm feeling that care and connection for all of everybody at the retreat. Receiving the goodness of all of us wanting to be free from this inner and outer home issue. But these teachings are about wanting everybody to be free of it, free of this harm. Just stop, stop the harm. To hold, if you can, it's a big jump, but just the whole planet. It's our beautiful home, this planet. Green, blue. Really seeing if you can care about all of us struggling to be free and kind. May we be kind hearted. May we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. May we experience the goodness of taking care of ourselves. The goodness of sitting here with each other, wishing each other well. And all of the beings everywhere. And really leaning into the form of the heart. care, joy, unconditional acceptance. We're going to have, um, it's time for walking for anybody who can stay up, if, depending on your time zone. And then, uh, um, but it's so nice to do the metta chant together and then sit together. So please come join us if you can. <laughs> 